But there are certainly two very distinct, more than five sigma detections of black holes of different masses. They're observed in the LIGO first observing ground, the O1, between September and January. So you see there aren't many months, but there are three of these. It is expected in the next few days, actually, that the run of two will start at LIGO with both Livingston and Hanford working at the same time, which we expect it would measure several of these black holes within the run, perhaps of the order of three to five. We'll see. It will be crucial in order to understand the properties if they are indeed the dark matter. Now, there's something very interesting that LIGO has to open up. We're used to, through X-ray studies, to associate black holes with objects which are compact, but they never reach more than about 10 solar masses. As we will see, this is one of the reasons why microlensing studies can go much beyond five to six years of monitoring the stars. Now, these black holes are extremely massive. Here are the four, the first ones we detected, the four of 30 solar masses, they merged to become about 60 solar masses. But the ones that came afterwards are not so small either, but pretty large. Okay, so we're talking about like a, a new population of black holes. Whether they are indeed a new population, they have nothing to do with astrophysics, it's still a matter of debate. We have to see whether indeed there are sophisticated mechanisms that may allow for those black holes to be produced. Otherwise, you have to find some new generation mechanisms. They have characteristic <coughs> frequency and amplitude dependencies within the sensitivity of advanced LIGO, both Hanford and Livingston. Those signals are right above the sensitivity. They last for a <coughs> few seconds or fractions of a second inside the sensitivity, and then once they merge, their amplitude through ring down comes dramatically down, so you no longer see them. Notice that there is here a wall due to seismic noise, which prevents you from measuring in spirals that may have ended before they entered the sensitivity band. This would occur for massive black holes, masses bigger than about 100 solar masses, because then your logic frequency, the inverse stable circular orbit, would be beyond the sensitivity from seismic noise of those detectors. So you won't be able to see them. You would require something like the Cyo, Einstein Telescope, or LISA way up in space. Right, however, if the masses are too small, since the amplitude is proportional to the mass of five thirds, you're simply below the sensitivity of the bottom curve. So either they're in the right range of masses or you don't see them. Okay? This is going to be a crucial limitation for the determination of Ramonic black holes of the dark matter of all humans. So as I said, only just a fraction of the time from 30 hertz, more or less the wall, the seismic wall, until plunge. Actually, notice that events like this one was expected from LIGO, that they were associated with neutron stars. So neutron stars, when they spiral, there's not much of a difference until you encounter that the a size of the neutron star is sufficiently big that they start hitting each other. If the amplitude if you have a mass of order, a solar mass, which is the mass of a neutron star, you could go on for many cycles inside your detector, but of course you would not see the plunging in, because this would take place much higher frequencies. So there was a chance, and they were expecting that they should see neutron stars merging, but you haven't seen a single one, possibly because the population of neutron stars is not as high as that of the black holes, especially if they are one. Right, I won't bother you, of course, with Details, masses are large, that's what I would conclude from these observations. They're able to determine also the spin. Surprisingly, so the spin is not large. It could be because the spin is parallel to the angular momentum of the orbit. So this is projected spin, but they measure with some accuracy. Still cannot tell what the individual spins of each one of those black holes were before merging. But there's definitely evidence of this. Spin. While most black holes that you would expect from standard evolution should have some spin. More about that later. Right, so what about the rates? How many of these events should I expect to see within the next few years? Well, that depends on the sensitivity of the detector and the actual events that have been observed. So the rate in 
the next three years for the Fossil Cube. If you add all of the information, which is summary that the LIGO collaboration brought up, you get around 50 plus or minus 100. And that's a big number. Okay? That means that within the volume of giga parsing, redshift 0.3 or so, in an economic manner, you would expect to see like 100 events per year. Wow. That's big. Okay? So if this is true and we continue observing those black holes, we're going to have the machine in advanced LIGO to measure the mass distribution of this object. And the mass distribution is a prediction of the models that say that those are primary black holes. So these mergers will be a telltale. So what do we have here? First, the discovery. Of course, in the future, when we have Virgo, unfortunately, Virgo could not be on time. It had difficulties with the suspension. The cables were too brittle. They had to be exchanged for uh, steel. And now they hope that perhaps March, they will be able to, to be on them. Okay, so for the moment, we don't have three detectors that we were, it was expected for round two. Kagura in the future from Japan might start online, maybe three years from now. LIGO India will start in 2020. By that time, we will have really gravitational wave astronomy in place. So we will have many different detectors looking at the same source and detecting simultaneously the emission of gravitational wave from these objects and being able to, for triangulation, determine where the source is, independently of whether there is an optical counterpart to that. So we have at least these two events in one country. We expect that the hundred events. We can map with this detector, well, the other experiments also, the mass and the spin of those black holes in the mass range between 10 to 150. Not smaller because it's not within sensitivity, not larger because it will be swapped by system Okay. So why do I say that these black holes might be primordial, but not just the evolution of some uh, stellar component of gas which has collapsed to form a black hole? Right, so we proposed this many years ago, 20 years ago, that indeed, in November, it was published, together with Andre Lind and David Watts, that density fluctuations in the early universe which produced large peaks in the power spectrum, could produce, very copiously, upon re-entry of those fluctuations during the radiation epoch, black holes. Nothing would prevent, even if you have radiation, if you have a very large density contrast, you have a large gradient, the gradient forces are enough to compress the radiation pressure, and this collapse to form black hole. If you have enough of those, and certain parameters of these uh, inflationary potentials, and this was in the context of hyperinflation, all of those black holes would be numerous enough and sufficiently massive that they constitute the dark matter. And this is the first instance of 96, where such a proposal was done based on inflation. Now, of course, it lasted quite a long time before we realized that these could be uh, detected. And just part of phrasing Steven Weinberg, he said, our problem is not that we take our theories too seriously, but we don't take them seriously enough. And it had to last almost 15 years before we <coughs> took this analysis and studying with Sebastian Kless the origin of such a peak in the power spectrum, we realized that it could not be as sharp as we had predicted in 1996 because we had lost information from quantum fluctuations, right as we went through the phase that produced the peak, like the end of inflation hybrid, and we have to take into account the stochastic formulas. That means taking into account that during the sitter, that feels diffusive. And the diffusion induced not a sharp peak, but a very broad peak. And this is going to change dramatically the scenario and the phenomenology. So we realized in this paper, 2015, that indeed primordial black holes could have had large stellar masses, <coughs> or even larger. As of today, we are merging. They could be responsible for the seats of galaxies and supermassive black holes, as well as intermediate massive black holes. I will discuss more about it in a while. And they could also be responsible for the ultraluminous X resources that we observe. Moreover, in page, I remember, 15 or so, 
We wrote, primordial wrap hole binary should emit gravitational waves that could be detected by future gravitational waves experiments such as binary size, etc. So this was a year before the announcement, nine months before the actual detection. Moreover, not only did we say that LIGO should detect those black holes, but actually we predicted that there should be a background, a stochastic background of gravitational waves from the <coughs> unresolved sources of inspirals all the way from the combination to today. And now we have a prediction, and I'll show you right at the end of this talk, of what is this stochastic background. It would not be able to be measured, probably, by advanced LIGO, just on the verge of its sensitivity by a fifth year uh, run. So we might have to wait for this. Lisa definitely will see such a thing without any difficulty. So where does the whole idea come from? Imagine that we deal with fluctuations, which should have a horizon 60 epochs before the end of inflation, right here, and modify the CME. We know pretty well what is the that scenario. We know how those fluctuations can give rise to metric fluctuations, which themselves give rise to density fluctuations, which induce temperature fluctuations. So we measure pretty well what is the spectrum of temperature fluctuations in the CME. We know it's a statistic, it is perfectly statistic with inflation. But the only difficulty is that we can only measure about 10 epochs of that evolution, from 65 to 55. We don't have the full range. The only thing we can do is assume that we have very simple physics describing that inflationary period and extrapolate all the way down to the end. Okay. Of course, that is a great extrapolation since we're talking about many orders of magnitude, 27 orders of magnitude. If we go from 3 to 27 orders of magnitude, it's obvious that we might get something wrong. And what could we get wrong? We could get wrong differences in the potential during inflation. It might happen that during inflation, say 20 influence or so before the end of inflation, a feature appears in the potential. That's perfectly possible. In fact, if you have something like an inflection point, which slows down, that field over there this is going to produce a high peak in the power spectrum. It's well known to many of you, I'm sure. Okay? So rather than having a red tilted spectrum with an amplitude that should be spurred of 10 to minus 5 on very large scales, CMP scales, on very tiny scales, it could be 10 to minus 10 or so. So on scales that will be required to produce the structure, first structure soon after recombination, which gave rise to the stars, the realization of the universe, the formation of structures, and so on, those amplitude might be too small. In this new scenario, what we have, we propose in 96, that there should be a peak, a very sharp peak. If, in this model of hybrid inflation, your field is evolving down the potential, suddenly you have a symmetry breaking field, it hits, which ends inflation, if there are a few weeks after that transition, fluctuation that left the horizon when the field had zero mass, or negative mass squared, this will produce a high peak in the power spectrum. There are as curvature fluctuations. They're going to perturb the curvature order one. This peak can, can be of the order of one or point one, okay, on those scales. And when those huge fluctuations, at very tiny scales, re-enter the horizon, they will collapse. Where the mass of the black hole that forms after the collapse would be just simply the amount of radiation that we have within the horizon. So those black holes are made out of photons. In the radiation epoch, matter is completely irrelevant. It's just made out of photons, which cannot prevent the collapse. So those black holes that form have a specific mass. Actually, it's a monochromatic spectrum of masses. Okay. Now, the scenario that we worked out there was did not take into account the fluctuation, the diffusion of those fields. Actually, there's not just a single field, there are two fields running right there the inflaton and the symmetry breaking field. And both fields are fluctuating. Their fluctuations give rise to a drop spectrum. That means that fluctuations that left before you went through the transition actually are also increasing the power in the curvature fluctuations. Okay? So much before the transition, you have the growth of the power spectrum. And then after the transition, you still have some fluctuations that come out of the horizon before you end the inflation. So 20 EFOs before the end of inflation, you produce a broad spectrum of curvature fluctuations. And this is the telltale. This is what is going to determine the feature that we believe describe primordial black holes as dark matter. Right. Notice that these scales are way below those that we can probe in the CMB with the realization epoch, especially in the future with a square kilometer array, or 
with larger structure, observations of the gap distribution in space. Otherwise, it's just as good as any other drug man component. It has zero pressure, you use the black holes and rest. These black holes will fill potential well of curvature fluctuations that are left many years before from inflation, and this just move like any other drug matter. In fact, most of the simulations, embody simulations that are produced to describe the large scale structure, consider as fundamental particles, their particle masses are 10 to the 9, 10 to the 11 solar masses. Way bigger than anything that I'm talking about here. 100 solar masses. It's okay. For that matter, particle dark matter and primary particle dark matter are exactly identical from the point of view of large scale structure formation. But we'll see that there are a specific signatures which are very different. Among others, the fact that since you have a very broad spectrum, and this went on for some time, then as fluctuations enter the horizon, when they enter the form black hole for the first time, above a certain threshold, which allows the formation of those, when they form, these black holes are on top of a very large fluctuating spectrum, which come from these high lines. Okay? So black holes are preferentially formed close to each other. Since you have a very large fluctuation, you have peaks over peaks over peaks. Okay. That means that you would have a very massive black hole surrounded by smaller black holes. And all this cluster of black holes is separate. They're not separate from another cluster of black holes. So black holes are not uniformly distributed uh, with different masses. No, they are clustered together. So the mass distribution around one of these clusters is characteristic of the shape of the power. So there's a one and one correspondence between that. And we will see that the difficulty that sterile models have for providing the closeness of those black holes so that in the, within the age of the universe, those black holes might merge. Here, it's provided directly by the model because those black holes are formed close to each other. You don't have to merge them from very far apart, hoping that they will lose energy until they merge. No, they merge directly from the start. In fact, they will start merging right after recombination when there's, there are no longer any photons around that will uh, move them. Of course, <coughs> this merging will produce a stochastic background, and eventually we should be able to see the stochastic background from merging since the combination. But let's see what happens with those black holes. This is a specific model. I want, don't want to bother you. It will be in the transparencies. You can download them and read them in detail. It's in our paper from 2015. The only thing which I want to remark is that the number of e-folds and the rate of expansion is going to give you the size of the horizon, the amount of matter that is within the horizon, therefore the mass of the black hole. Since different scales re-enter the horizon at different times, the masses of the black holes are distributed like a log normal. It's a Gaussian in N, therefore it's a log normal in mass. Okay? So you have a log normal distribution of masses for primary black hole. And this is the type of spectrum that we produced in 2015 before any measurement of these black holes. So typically, these are the kind of peaks that we produce. So yeah, around 20 before, before the end of inflation. Some models can be as large as 10 minus 4, 25 or so. Larger and larger models, of course, will have larger amplitudes. These will be completely ruled out, but they are ruled out anyway, because they will modify the CMB. So we better make sure that along the CMB scales from 65 to 55, the power spectrum is perfectly flat, as we observe. <coughs> Even further down, through Lyman Alpha Forest and through a 21 centimeter intensity mapping, also we will be able to put constraints on the shape of the power spectrum. Okay. Now, the power spectrum at the time of formation during the radiation era can be traced back into a distribution of masses for those black holes, which are essentially of this sort. Okay. Notice that the maximum fraction at the time of formation in the radiation era is a small 10 to minus 8. It's the largest, typically 10 to minus 12, 10 to minus 10. That means it's completely negligible. We have to wait until those black holes redshift, they just simply dilute away, while the radiation is diluting one or more in, in scale factor, and therefore by the time of matter radiation equality, those black holes have exactly the same density as the radiation. So if they are the dark matter, then at the time of equality, their contribution to the total energy density should be 0.42, the rest being the variance, 0.5. So these 
for the models that I was describing before. The problem is that depending on the range, you could perfectly account for the amount of black holes keeping the dark matter. And we have a whole plethora of possible models. Then the choice is what are the parameters of the model that precisely gives you the peak where it is measuring and the width that it measures. Okay? Once we have those measurements from gravitational wave observations, we will be able to map back to the early universe what was the shape of the potential, what was the dynamics before the end of inflation, which gave rise to the fluctuation by the background of gauge bars to primary battles. So what are the constraints? Up to now, you say, well, that's interesting, but aren't black holes primary black holes already ruled out? What are you talking about? OK, black holes that are comprised of all of the dark matter are not ruled out, especially if they have a mass distribution. You don't have to have 100% of all of them if you have a monochrome spectrum comprising all of the halo of our galaxy or all of the dark matter in the universe. No, it's enough to have, at the maximum, something like 10% and very broad tails. The broad tails, among others, will produce black holes which will have 10 to the 5 or so, 3 to 10 to the 5 solar masses, and they would be the seeds of galaxies. That's the place where gas will accrete and will form the first accretion disks that will measure as galaxies a range of tail. Later on, they will evolve, some of these will become active, accreting even more gas and produce the AGX active galaxy nuclei. So if these black holes in their tails give rise to the seeds of galaxies, we will have a way to quick start structure formation. And I explain why we observe those galaxies at those high redshifts. Well, it's extremely difficult. Remember the power spectrum. According to Nanda Kovrachmari, there's just a single field. If you go down to very small scales, there's not enough power to produce the galaxies we observe at redshift 10. You would have to speed up structure formation, whatever the mechanism either through non-Gaussian features in the power so that those tails of the distribution with would have sufficient amplitude, or does it reinvent new mechanisms? Here, it's natural. So you have here another uh, phenomenon which seems to go in the same direction. Moreover, you may argue, well, come on, aren't primordial black holes ruled out already by microlensing events? Well, you're all very familiar with the fact that uh, microlensing events require, I will go down slightly over it with some detail, that you monitor the light of stars from, say, the large magnetic cloud with sufficiently long times that you can follow the light curve of those stars all the way from the start shining larger as this object goes beyond you and, and, the, and the star. And depending on the ice and rain, which is directly proportional to the mass of this black hole, the larger the mass, the larger the ice and rain, and therefore the longer it takes for the light curve to go up and down. Now, microlensing experiments, all of Eros, Machen, etc., they have been monitoring stars for about six years, 5.7 in case of Machen. So they did not probe the higher than 10 solar masses. This is the reason why they ended up at around 10 solar masses, giving you no extra constraint on the ground. And the argument was, why did you stop there? Why did you go on for another decade, for another series of decades so that you could rule out all the way to very high masses. Well, it's quite interesting. First, there are two issues to it. One is sociological and the other one is physical. It's some uh, unfortunate fact. The sociological one was that most of these objects, compact objects that were expected to be in the galaxy were assumed to come through stellar evolution. And we know through stellar evolution that it's extremely difficult to generate black holes of masses bigger than 10 sort of masses. Okay, when we have 250 solar mass that collapses to form a black hole through a supernova, the only object that it typically produces is a neutral star or not very heavy black hole. Those are the 10 solar mass black holes that are observed from X-rays. It's very rare to produce very massive black holes. Nowadays, people have come up with mechanisms through gravitational collapse without a supernova evolution, and that has, requires very low metallicity environments, which would collapse directly the whole thing down to form a black hole. These are very rare. It's even more rare to find them closer together. We'll discuss that later on. But still, nobody expected those black holes to have more than 10 solar masses. That's the reason why they stopped here. They didn't go further. The other reason have to do with a paper, a very famous paper, by Ricotti, Matt, and Ostrager 
people from Princeton, everybody believed, which claimed that this is the curve of fire ice, which was here, it started here, and dropped down, which re assumes the following. It says, imagine before a combination, you have black holes of a given mass. They are centers of accretion. Gas falls into those potential wells, and they reject energy back into the plasma. The rate of injection of energy to the plasma distorts the black hole spectrum. There's not enough time since that moment until recombination to diffuse and restabilize or to reshape that into a single temperature. So what you would expect is to see a rise of the high tails of the Planck distribution. At high frequencies, you expect to see an increment. And there are very strict constraints coming from COVID fire experiment on the Y parameter, condensation parameter, and the new parameter, the chemical potential. They could not be bigger than 10 to minus 5. And that was enough for them to put a constraint here. Unfortunately, they didn't realize that was a, I'm going to say, a little error or mistake, which uh, led astray the, the community for quite a long time, which is on an integral over the energy, they wrote dA over AH as dt. And they forgot to change that into redshift by including a factor of 1 plus c squared. This missing 1 plus c squared in the denominator gives you a factor of 10 to the 6, so a million times weaker effect. So there are claims that black holes of, say, 0.1 super masses, or solar mass, were ruled out because of virus constraints on the water is wrong. And it's been moved to the value that we have, something like a thousand solar masses. So, and they agree on this. Not seen anything that they have not decided. There's a paper coming soon that will appear in the, in the archive, which shows indeed what are the constraints now from fire and how they moved back to a thousand or so at the maximum. That means that we have here a whole area to explore. There could be primary black holes with such masses there. And this is something which in 2015, we predicted this is a curve that we said might contain the primordial black hole that could give the dark matter. And surprisingly, spot on, it's the place where light has a temperature black hole. So, these massive black holes are not the small primordial black holes of the fire plant, as well as 24 to 26 solar masses. These are massive, they will cluster and merge, and will resolve, I will describe a little bit on this the quadrant matter paradigm, some of the problems of this quadrant matter paradigm. So in body simulations, as I described, have, they never reach 100 solar mass uh, particle resolution. Typically, are 10 to the 6 if they do hyperdynamics on small scales, or 10 to the 9, 10 to the 11 if they do cosmological scales. So what I'm talking about is here, this depicted here. We have the solar black holes <coughs> formed from stellar evolution. Typically, having a fall off very fast, around 10 solar masses, which should be sharper here. Then we have the supermassive black holes of 10 to the 9, 10 to the 11 solar masses. The intermediate mass black holes, 10 to the 4, 10 to the 5 solar masses. And then this new population that the Grand Jury Observatory have discovered. And I claim that these three are actually real. Why do I claim this? Well. You could measure, and it has been done with hundreds already of uh, objects. You can measure the mass of the black hole. You can measure the uh, velocity distribution of this object, supermassive, intermediate, etc. And you observe that there is a linear relation between sigma. That probably tells you what was the mechanism that generated those. Probably there was initial C, which created gas. The gas moved in the potential well and gave a direct relation between the velocity of orbit around that black hole and the mass of the ocean. As the gas accreted more and more into those black holes, the relation was stressed. Well, this relationship, very recently, has been found to be exactly the same as that of intermediate mass black holes. Ten years ago, we didn't have any intermediate mass black hole with us. Now we know that there is just a continuation of the supermassive black hole, linear regression in log of space of the velocity distribution and the mass. And I claim that these holes here are just simply observational artifacts. They are there. We just have to look carefully. There are black holes of masses of 10 to the 5, and velocity distribution of tens of kilometers per second, 
I will show you some of these fields. And there are also objects of ten to the three so solar masses lurking inside dwarf asteroids, which are very difficult to measure. You have to have the, the right conditions, and I will describe one of these that we discovered recently. Okay, so how can we distinguish this from stellar black holes? First, those black holes that form in the early universe through gravitational collapse in the radiation epoch do not form because of gas accreting from a companion. So there are no accretion distances. Typically, they're isolated. Okay. It's true that gas may fall in. The cross-section or the captured cross-section is tiny. It's very difficult to make them grow as a function of mass. So typically, they don't have accretion distances. Possibly, it's just one die accretion. Moreover, since those black holes start being perfectly static, the collapse of all the gas during in the radiation epoch will induce no preferred axis, so you don't expect any spin, and no preferred velocity. The typical black hole kicks at formation when you have stellar evolution, you just throw these black holes at tremendous speeds. Here, the whole ball collapses to form a black hole and sits there, surrounded by other black holes. Its motion due to the gravitational potential of the other black holes, which sets these into motion. So their mass distribution has nothing to do with the initial mass function of gas. Those black holes at formation are not there, so they are actually static. They will be the galactic seeds for structure formation. We hope to measure them through long duration uh, events for microlensing, and we have a project within the Dark Empty Survey, which I am a member, where we're going to monitor look at ancillary data from slow digital sky survey and then continue the observation for long periods, say 20 years, today, to see how, since we have different bands, to see the electricity, how those curves change as a function of time, and see whether indeed we find events which are of over 20 or so years, which would tell you about massive objects of 100 or so and so of masses. So there's a, another series of phenomena Astrometry, I'll, I'll go through very briefly. Realization, this will be faster in the past. The only information we have from realization at the moment, that will change dynamically in the next decade or so, is from the optical depth from CLB. But that's an integral quantity. It's just simply what's the probability for range of to to today. The actual details of how the realization occur very much depend on the theory of structure formation. So this is going to change that theory dramatically. You're going to show that these objects, if they collapse early, they will gain mass through uh, gas depression, they will reionize the universe, and the rate at which it reionizes the universe is something which is very specific to the scenario. And it will be very different from the usual mass. Okay, so what are the signatures of these primary models? I was talking about microlensing, you all know about this. Let go forward. It has three main features. It should be symmetric in time. It should be achromatic. Okay, here you have two bands, the blue and the red, from the matching collaboration. And you divide one by the other, this is essentially one within very good accuracy. And it should be unique. And this is the thing which is most difficult, of course. You have to monitor those stars for a sufficiently long time that you don't see, like you would have in a variable star, that the object again shines out. Okay? If it does, <coughs> it wasn't a match. It was a massive compact. <coughs> it was something else. You know, we start. Maybe a peculiar one, which had exactly the same shape, and it was achromatic, which is very unusual for a very big star. But still, it could be. Okay. So, so that means that if you had a point one solar masses and a, a time of increment and decrement of light of a few days, you have to go on to measure these light curves, which would have very long duration, tens of years, and be sure for another 20 years that the light from that star doesn't go up again. So here's a sketch of one of the typical time scales. You can directly from the eyes and radio determine what's the average half crossing. For 100 solar masses is 4 years. That means the total duration is 8 years. You have to wait for another 20 years before you're sure that this object didn't write up. Okay? Now, I was talking to um, Patrick Tisserin from Ogo, and he was claiming that they stopped measuring whenever they went beyond five years, six years, or any of the stars. They were not keeping data of the brightening of stars for longer than about five or six years. So they had a natural cut on their, uh, on their event because they simply could not deal with that many events. So they were hoping that those black holes would have below a few solar masses, and therefore they would not see the whole curve. 
So they say, OK, that means that they're not sensitive to objects for 100 solar masses. No wonder they can constrain them. And these were the curves of the okay. So, which is about 10. Moreover, <coughs> we know from standard polar matter paradigm that if you let structure form by hierarchical merging, you produce bigger structures from creating smaller structures. And this keeps on, so it's getting very all the way until you reach superstructures, like superclusters. Then you have a problem. And the problem is called the missing satellite problem. But let me first describe, maybe I'll jump ahead. Yes, let me first describe what are the differences with respect to the standard particle dark matter that we're familiar with. First, imagine that you have stars on a given volume. This is actually sphere. And you imagine that this is filled up with particle dark matter, things which are much smaller than the size of the stars. Of course, they are uniformly distributed in any given volume. And therefore, stars move within this volume as if there were no particles. Okay? The Gauss theorem tells you that the forces on each one of these galaxies, sorry, each one of these stars, is completely irrelevant. You can ignore it. Okay? But now, let's concentrate all that volume into one point and call that the primordial black hole. These primordial black holes, of course, most of the stars within the volume will not feel the attraction of that primordial black hole. Okay, it's sufficiently far away that the tiny acceleration is induced by that primordial black hole, unpredictable, except for a few stars that move close together. That's why I call it the Rutherford model rather than the Thompson model. So there will be a few instances of stars. I will show you 10 to 5 within a volume of 30 or so parsecs, which will have sufficiently close impact parameter to the black hole to change significantly its velocity and its acceleration. So you might see that you have a compact core out there because the star will suddenly change momentum. Just like alpha particles in all forms. So what is the missing satellite problem, which will be related to what I just described? The missing satellite problem is a problem that cold dark matter simulations have when they look for the formation of structure of objects like galaxies from tiny uh, gas or halos of dark matter of masses much smaller. This object is formed as this is part of in for dynamical friction, and they end up forming a larger structure that we call a galaxy. Now, as you can see from that simple picture, it's full of little dots all over the place. Okay? There are many more structures, more structures than you seem to observe around our galaxy. In fact, you can actually do the numbers, be quantitative. Dwarf astronomers are 10 years ago. Of the order of 10 or so, Sagittarius, the small one, the large one, the cloud, Ornax, Moshka, etc. All of those little objects certainly do not, cannot account for what was expected from the standard polar matter. So somehow we have a problem. You might either argue that dark matter does not behave on small scales as a strictly cold dark matter without interaction, so maybe there are interactions, or we just simply missing those objects, we're not seeing them. And indeed, this is something which seems to have come up and surprised all of us. We saw the number of objects that were known five years ago, and now they're distributed around the Milky Way this way. Okay. Dwarf galaxies after 2005, you see, many have been observed <coughs> before 2005. And very recently, with our dark entity survey, which I remember, we have found of the order of 28 dwarf astronomers. Why is dark entity survey extremely powerful here? Because it has a wide field of view, and it can uh, monitor the light for those objects and stay there for 300 seconds taking photographs. So they're going to stump up low surface brightness objects which you would not have measured otherwise. They're going to come to you. You're going to see them through those long time exposures. And you are going to be able to measure the number of objects that you have within those dwarf astronomers. And surprisingly, they have found that these dwarf astronomers have huge astrolite ratios. It's made mostly of dark matter, not made of stuff. You could follow 
from their, the orbits of stars, where, what, how much dark matter there is. And they're very faint, they have not been seen before, and full of dark matter. Maybe those are the objects which actually were missing in our galaxy. So this is the area, and I put dots where all those dwarf spherules that have been measured. These are the published ones. There are 18 here. Now we have 28. Ten of these will be published soon. And this is the area in the south that dark energy survey measures. If we extrapolate that area, we only covered 5,000 square degrees, to the full sky, 40,000 square degrees, you could perfectly account for all the missing satellites that we were searching for for so many years. So if this is correct, then dwarf spherules, so the substructure was there. We just simply didn't have the power to measure it. We didn't have the ability, we were not exposing it long enough, to make them stand up and be seen. And the next question is, how come did those objects lose their stars? Why don't we see them? Where did their stars go? And this is where this idea of primordial black holes they come to the rescue. Because imagine, remember that I was describing before, you have stars moving in a potential well of uh, all the stars, and from time to time you have a black hole. If the impact parameter of one star with respect to that black hole is sufficiently close, it would exchange energy momentum with the black hole. For instance, imagine that you have a star moving in this dwarf spheroidal. It's a very shallow potential well. Its velocity is typically 10 kilometers per second. Black holes, which are more massive, they tend to dynamical friction goes to the center. They are orbiting the inner potential well. Their velocities are much bigger. And now you have a star which scatters off one of these black holes. The exchange momentum. So you have a mass, a light star, one sort of mass, a heavy black hole, hundreds of masses, with large velocities. And it exchanges momentum so that the velocity of the star, after this slingshot effect, the same effect that take satellites to the outer solar system, would increase their velocity by factor 20 or so. That means that if not in the first interaction, but in the next one, after a few interactions, the star will go out of the potential web of the daughter phenomenon. It's going to be thrown out. The slingshot effect will throw stars out of the potential web. It's like playing golf with stars. You hit it, bam, there it goes. The star flown away from the dwarf phenomenon. That means that even if you started 5,000 million years ago with stars within those spheroidals, the fact that dark matter is made of black holes would make, thank you, would make those stars fly away. And you would end up with very low surface brightness. Those objects, again, have very shallow potential wells, so they very rarely keep the gas. So the only thing that shines is stars. If stars are thrown away, they simply don't shine. Okay? This might explain also all the features I'm sure you have heard of, galaxies which have 99.99 of all of their mass in dark matter. There are no stars there. Maybe they were formed by these dwarf phenomena which kept on accreting uh, to forming these large objects. So this is a natural mechanism to explaining that very large mass vibrations observed in dwarf phenomena from dark matter. OK, <coughs> very briefly, or maybe I, I should uh, wait for questions, which I'm sure will be plenty, to discuss this uh, diagram. I'll leave it there. Let me go for, to Gaia and possible astrometric anomalies that Gaia can be able to measure. Remember, I was describing, if you uh, concentrate all the dark matter that supposedly gives the rotation curves of the galaxy, our Milky Way, and we concentrate that onto black holes of mass about 50 solar masses, this would be a range of different black holes orbiting each other, concentrated in, in a little cluster of 50 solar masses, then the volume that these occupies is about 40 parsecs of that cube. Within that volume, there are 10 to the 5 stars. A few of those stars will have encounters, and we are going to search for those stars with Gaia. So what's the relative acceleration that these produces? Those stars are moving in the potential of the other stars, the usual Newtonian potential, plus the anomalous acceleration induced by this black hole, which will not be there in part of dark matter, uh, use of Gauss law, but induces very tiny accelerations unless you go to very small impact parameters, as usual. Unless you probe the inner part of the potential, you're not going to make a, a large acceleration difference. Now, if you really go close, like 0.1 parsecs, and you ask what is the relative change in velocity with respect to 200 kilometers per second 
for the motion of the stars in our galaxy, we find one particle to the third, or a few, that's the minus four. Okay, that's reasonable, that's something which we can search for. Gaia has a solution to look for this. Moreover, if you ask what will be the relative displacement of a star from us at a distance of one kiloparsec, okay, you multiply this velocity difference and you ask what would I see of the motion of that star, it's of the order of half a milli arc second. Of course, ordinary telescopes would not be able to tell this apart, but Gaia can. Gaia is the machine that should be able, by monitoring hundreds or thousands of millions of stars in our galaxy, to see whether one of these stars, or a hundred or a thousand of these stars, have changed their trajectory because of the presence of a compact object, like a grand of 50 to hundreds of thousands. Right. Moreover, there's something tantalizing evidence that such a feature might have been here, not just in our halo of our galaxy, but way before in the early universe, at Redshift 20, because of some observation that I was not aware of when we proposed this, so we didn't predict it, but Alexander, sorry, Kaczynski detected the uh, Y. But we did predict, however, sorry if this is the truth, is not mixed. There is evidence, or at least there are some factors suggesting that point sources in the Fermi lab, this diffuse uh, background, gamma background, essentially towards the galactic center, which were thought to be due to dark matter annihilation, actually is not diffuse. It has centers. So there are different statistics, different groups. In February 2016, published this, official letters, and showed that the diffuse gamma background that Fermi had observed actually has point sources. And perhaps these point sources are those black holes, which have gas around them and re emit in gas. We are exploring at the moment, between the people from Fermi and from, from Magic, whether indeed such objects could be due to black holes. We're working on it now. But moreover, this is what I was trying to cash there seems to be a correlation, very strong correlation, between the cosmic infrared background and the soft X-ray background fluctuations. This is a sky where most of these are point sources of stars, measured in the infrared by Kaczynski with Spitzer. And this, through Pinterest, when you cut out those point sources, are the fluctuations in the soft gamma, soft X-ray, sorry, not gamma, sorry, X-ray. So again, there's a one-to-one -one correspondence in this patch of the sky, which is not very big. I think it's towards the core cluster. <coughs> so the fluctuations in the cosmic infrared background, we're talking about microns. And the fluctuations in the soft X-ray background, these are, let's say, NEDs. These two fluctuations, they could not have been through stellar motion. There is no physics that can connect the X-ray and the infrared at that hundred percent correlation. So Kaczynski proposed that the actual sources were deep potential wells at Redshift 20, so that the infrared background was actually a UV background at the time it was emitted, and the soft X-ray background was actually a hard X-ray or gamma background. So in order to produce both a UV and a gamma background from the same source, you have to have a very deep potential well. That means you need a compact source. It cannot be gas. Okay. It has to be a black hole. And he claims, <coughs> independent of our work, he claims that those black holes actually had to be primordial. They are a of 20, there's not enough stellar evolution to produce those black holes, and they are all over the place. If these fluctuations we observe are due to primordial black holes, they are actually permeating the whole space. So this complements our predictions very nicely. Moreover, since we're talking about infrared and gamma, it's expected that this should be seen also in 21 centimeters in gray. So it's the time for SKD to go up there and measure the fluctuations in the 21 centimeter intensity mountains and see whether they match exactly the other backgrounds. Because if they do, then they're telling us something happened at Reggie 20, which was not a standard evolution. It was primordial. Right, and here, of course, I, I will end. I think I have minus two minutes. So there are gravitational waves from advanced LIGO and from ESA. Very briefly, we uh, <coughs> predicted in 
mark that if we continue with a gravitational wave antenna, we might be able to detect the spin and mass distribution of parabolic black holes in this range. We have seen that with thinner model, just changing the values of the mean in the, in the log normal distribution, the value of the peak from 10 to 30 to 60 solar masses, we see that we can account for the rate of events that happen in circular advanced LIGO. And moreover, in the future, by pinpointing one of these uh, specific points <coughs> from observation, we might tell apart what was the primordial spectrum responsible for the formation of those black holes. Moreover, in our case, since we don't have just a delta function, we have a whole distribution, we can ask how are the different masses distributed. And it seems, according to certain values, most of them are just simply diffused around, but for some values and for some widths of the distribution, you can account for the event rates of tens or per year per year per Q. But moreover, you can tell from here that these, the most probable event will not have black holes of the same mass. They should be a slightly displaced, in fact, 1.2, 1.3, which surprisingly is similar to what I had seen. They're not exactly identical. 29 and 32, etc. Moreover, we could measure this with LISA. So LISA will have sensitivity in the millihertz. Okay, so it's a satellite orbiting the Earth. It has been approved now to have three arms, and it will improve the sensitivity. You typically was searching for the heat spiraling of supermassive black holes, but it will also measure the stochastic background. So if you have mergers of black holes, since, <coughs> say, Redshift 20 or even higher, those mergers, successive mergers, through this cluster of black holes are going to emit gravitational waves. And these black holes will be seen by LISA either as individual events, if they're sufficiently bright, and Redshift 10, for instance, or if you cannot resolve those sources, you will see them as in stochastic background. So the stochastic background of gravitational waves have, depending on the width of the distribution of the log normal and the mean of the distribution, it will easily go inside the sensitivity of LISA. This was for different sizes, 2.5 or 5 million uh, kilometer arm lengths. That's what the sensitivity is telling you about. It's just below the advanced LIGO fifth run, the green curve. Unless they improve the sensitivity, they're not going to see this radiation wave background from the primary black holes. This is the amplitude. 1.29, it has a very clear frequency dependence and mass dependence. Okay. So you could play with this. Fortunately, the larger the width of the distribution, okay. the larger the signal. And therefore, even for a small mass okay. as the mean value for those black holes, if the distribution is sufficiently wide, you can still detect it. That's extremely encouraging. Because notice that 0.1 sort of mass black holes are never going to be by a stellar evolution. There's no way, because of the channel second limit, that you would produce black holes which have below solar mass. That could only be primordial. Okay? So if we measure with LISA that there are primordial black holes which are fixed with a peak at 0.1 solar masses, those necessarily have to be produced. Okay, <coughs> this estochastic background suggests that primordial black holes cover the whole range. This is the background that we predict. SKA will also help the very long wave stochastic background at nanohertz with such an amplitude. And of course, the potential wave astronomy is the future. So let me end here. Black holes would see the galaxies at high redshift. Realization will start earlier. Larger galaxies form earlier than in lambda quadratic matter. It's much higher power in certain scales. Massive black holes could be at the center of wastes at redshift being at 10 also form the gas that we observe at region 10. There would be growth of structure, this hierarchical, just like any other quadratic matter. It would form structure larger and larger. It would form, I didn't discuss anything about these ultraluminous X-ray trenchants. So if you have a black hole, one of these primordial black holes, and you have a star which has an impact parameter sufficiently close that it disrupts the envelope of the star, then it will shine suddenly within X-rays. These are very luminous, ultraluminous X-ray sources. And we have many of these observed in our galaxy and in Andromeda, and they cannot be accounted for for the usual evolution through a supernova collapse. Okay, so maybe they are. We don't know. It's difficult from the outside to see. 
We will see, obviously, through a bunch of the British with the burning of the house. I can bet with you that within the next run until uh, June, we will see uh, something like three or four more events. And in my extended substructure. Future test I have described already. Let me very briefly mention that when I said at the beginning that we can that particle dark matter is dead, of course I'm talking about WIMPs, not axioms. It could be that they are axioms. But very soon, this is the situation of observations today. This is the recent Lux and Panda X result from this year. Okay. We have begun to touch the neutrino irreducible background. So even if we improve this, okay, and there are ideas to do this with Panda X, we're not going to measure this because you're completely swamped by the neutrino background. And with this, I leave you. Thank you very much for your time. Um, my understanding is that PC will measure deviations from the probably you know, so Correct. Um, what is your expectation? What, you know, I think that's the end predicts 10 to minus 8 for the new distortion. That's right. Um, we also predict 10 to minus 8. So right. if that depends very much on the mean value of the is log normal distribution. So if this is around, say, below a solar mass, and you gain mass by merging, today there would be close to 13, 15 solar masses. Before a combination with those effects would be most important, you get something like 10 minus 8. And this was already predicted in 2015 paper. So we said, look with Pixie, because Pixie is going to show you that some source of energy is being injected back into the plasma and distorting the target spectrum of the CV. It's quite close. So 10 minus 8, 10 minus 8. It depends very much on the model. It's a pity that maybe I can search. Uh, I can show you afterwards. I can show you the figure that we wrote in this paper. Other questions? Yes? Sorry, what is the first experiment that might prove the model wrong? Sorry, I could not. What's the first experiment that might prove the paradigm wrong? Hmm. Right. Um, I can answer. <laughs> I would say. They're already taking data with DS. If we don't find any event, and we're monitoring 7 million stars in our galaxy, especially within the Stray 2 region, if we don't measure any of these objects, like 40 solar masses, with duration of 10 or so years, and we're using the data from Sloan and so on. Remember, the Sloan and DS have exactly the same bands. U, G, R, I, Z, okay, they're different optical bands, very wide ones, but they're enough for you to distinguish them. They're the achromaticity of the light curves of those stars, right? They're more than enough, actually four points rather than two, like much as. So if we could monitor those stars from, say, 1995, when it's started, all the way until today, <coughs> a decade and a half or almost two decades after, then you would be able to tell whether indeed there are these objects. Of course, remember that we don't have to have 100% of all the dark matter into a single mass because of this wide distribution. So you can compensate by having a very short peak and very narrow distribution or much broader peak and lower in amplitude. So microlensing has a chance. It's not 100% uh, sure. Another is pixie, definitely, because these black holes, if they are primordial, they were there before recombination. So they must have injected back energy into the, into the plasma. That's definitely one of those. Yes? Yeah, there were recently two, two experiments, or two kinds of experiments I claim to put more stringent constraints in the yeah. uh, perspective of mass spectrum. So the first one is the time delay of, uh, of uh, both our timing arrays. Right. Uh, and the uh, second one was the uh, quite interesting clever idea. Yeah. The, so based on these, these um, the possibility of having a uh, deflection of stars, where the, the, this thing I could explain that there are no stars in the missing uh, in the South Islands. Uh, the, that could dis so this effect could disrupt the, some star clusters, like Rogers clusters. Thank you very much. Okay, yeah, let's yeah, go to that. Right. That's the figure I have prepared. I, I was not agreeing with you. Don't take it, make me wrong. It's not that I asked you to make this question, but I have prepared it. <laughs> so, yeah. this is. I'll be happy to answer it. Okay, so <coughs> Eridanos 
two. It's one of those dwarfish phenomenons which are actually far away, but they are sufficiently bright that you can follow not just the distribution of stars around the dwarfish phenomenon, but also a cluster of stars very close to the center. It's true that you just have to make a projection effect and assume that indeed it's right at the center rather than a, in between the dwarfish phenomenon and, and ourselves, because it's far away. So if it is at the center, then the argument that you were making, heavy black holes would, which would form the halo of this dwarfish phenomenon, they would, by dynamical friction, go to the center. What would they do? Just like we were saying about black holes scattering off the stars, stars off black holes here, the black holes would puff up. That's the center. What it would do is just simply diffuse. It would create like a diffusion curve. This is well known, got to remain in the 1970s. So what it would do for the stars, it just split, they would grow up. It would not be as compact. Okay? So the argument by Brandt, 2016, a couple of months ago, was that, look, if there are stellar clusters very close to the center of these daughter phenomena, they cannot be 50 solar mass black holes around them to create the halo. Okay? Because they would have disrupted the trajectories of those stars, and they, those stars would have popped up. And they would not last, therefore, thousands of millions of years. And it is assumed, through the stellar uh, ages of those stars, that these stellar clusters have typically 3 to 10 giga years. But they forgot something crucial. That is, if you have an intermediate mass black hole at the center of this dwarf phenomenon, as we claim, then necessarily that will act like an accretion, like a stabilizing force. So you might have black holes giving the gravitational potential well of the black hole, the intermediate mass black hole, 1,500 solar masses at the center of that cluster will stabilize those stars. Very much like what we have in our own galaxy. We observe a stellar cluster around the center of our hole. It would have been disrupted long ago. These stars have fallen in in the last few millions, thousands of millions of years, and they're still there even if you have a matter in the form of So I worked out what were the constraints that without a black hole, and this is the Brandt et al. Brandt, actually, himself. Paper, this is what it would have discarded more than, say, 50% at 10 solar masses, OK, is the curve. If you include an intermediate mass black hole right at the center, you just simply lose the bound. And your bound goes to the right. So you still have perfectly nice place where you have primary records. But thank you very much for bringing it up. It strengthens my argument even further. So it's, it's telling me that these dwarfish phenomena, which might have stellar clusters at the center, would be stabilized by the intermediate mass black holes, which themselves are not ad hoc put there. It's just simply part of the whole paradigm. The whole paradigm is telling you that dark matter in the form of black holes is going to form a structure, and it will start by seeding those initial objects which then grow in mass through accretion. So all dwarf phenomena should have. This is a prediction of the model. Go and search, and we're doing that. They should have an intermediate mass map on the center. Yes? The last one, please. Just for instance, in order to explain the dwarf phenomena, I think you said that there was no dark matter halo where all the mass then gets concentrated into the center. The no, no, no. Black holes form the halo, There's and those black holes orbit around. So there is a black hole creating the dark matter halo. It's the gas, it's the gas, which falls into those uh, potential wells, which will not form or will form stars. So we have they form stars? Black holes. Yeah, that's that's what you're saying. The, the stars are there. That's right. In your picture, the way you which explain uh, in one of your, I think, okay. maybe a few, yeah, for this one, you explain that you could, you, many of these stars are kicked away. Yeah. So you, you decrease the luminosity, they become dwarfs because you have the this your Rutherford model. I guess it doesn't exist one. Mm -hmm. So you have all the mass of the concentrated mass. Yes, yes, precisely. Mm -hmm. And instead of having a halo. Sure. So no, no, it's not that you don't have a halo. <laughs> wait, wait. You have to think of the scales at which we're talking. Yeah. Those were below of the order of a parsec scale. Okay? Oh. Thirty thirty parsecs. Within thirty parsecs you have to take to the five stars. This is the halo of our galaxy, the halo of the dwarf for that. Not confused one to the other. We were describing for this, we want to know how would Gaia measure the deviation of stars within our halo. Our halo being that of the Milky Way. So if we ask in our vicinity how many stars do we have per parsec, we have typically one star per parsec. Okay? Within this volume, 
if you describe the dark matter in terms of black holes, then black holes should be separate by about 50 to 60 parsecs, twice 30. Okay? That means that within a volume of 30 cubed, you would have nothing but stars and a single black hole, or a single cluster of the graph. So this distribution is very different from what you have in Dr. Ferrero. Dr. Ferrero, you have the same uh, objects. They're all within the small potential well. Some of these black holes also will be thrown out because they would have larger velocities, just like stars. Do. But you still have retained at the center enough of these black holes to scatter off stars. So the scattering of stars in the dwarf sphere is different from the scattering of stars in our galaxy because of the potential well. Some have a 10 kilometers per second, others have a 200 kilometers per second. Okay. That's the main difference. Thank you. Uh, You're welcome.